also to mention the work that I will be presenting here on airborne wind energy for Martian habitats. Uh, that is not my own work only, but a work of many people, um, of which also Angelo. Also, um, so we have two student teams at uh, aerospace engineering faculty uh, with uh, 10 students each working for 10 weeks. Um, non-stop on, on this topic. We had a master's student, uh, Mario Rodriguez, who will also be the last speaker of today, but on a different topic because he moved on from Pew Delft to Blue Origin in Huntsville, Alabama, to work on the upper stage engine. But more about this later. My work is um, Roland Schmel. I'm an associate professor at the Faculty of Aerospace Engineering. Um, where I work since 2009 on air wind energy or kite power. So that's the outline for my presentation. First, speak about the context, the challenges of air wind or wind energy on Mars, a um, bit about the siting, wind resource, how we model the performance of our kite system, um, then the optimized performance and Finally, the application that came out. That's the context. Henrietta already mentioned the Rezone project funded by the European Space Agency and Vertigo uh, was about Martian habitat construction and operation. And our part was to provide the energy for this uh, operation. Um, I should say it was an um, an ideas competition with the European Space Agency. This is how it all started. Um, and it evolved into this uh, multi-student multi team uh, graduation project, now uh, even a PhD project in Rieda, um, focusing here on the construction. <clears throat> so what is airborne wind energy? Uh, maybe a question, who has heard about this before? Airborne wind kite power? Okay, so enough uh, to go a bit more into detail. We use a kite here, you see it flying a ground station connected with a tether, and that whole thing replaces a wind turbine. Um, this is a real system, a 100 kilowatt system that we currently operate with our spin-off company in Bangor Aris, Ireland, because <clears throat> it's a lot of empty space which we need at this moment of um, development. How is it working? We fly the kite in crosswind maneuvers, um, pulling the tether from a drum uh, that is connected to a generator that creates energy. Once we have the tether reeled out to its full length, uh, the drum generator pulls it back, uh, consuming a bit of this energy. The net energy, is actually what we produce. There is always a battery or a storage involved to buffer the energy flow between real out and real in. That's how it works. Um, these are the, um, let's say, the, the advantages. Uh, up to 90% less material compared to conventional wind, highly mobile, so you can bring this system everywhere very rapidly and deploy it also very rapidly within, currently within one hour from uh, placing the system, we are operational airborne and harvest energy. And that energy can be captured at different heights. So you can really adjust the operation to the varying wind profile. We'll see this later, which gives us an advantage in uh, capacity factor. So. Uh, if a, a wind turbine has capacity factor of 30%, so 30% of the time it operates at, at the rated power, we are at about 60% because of this adjustability. On the minus side, the challenges, as you can imagine, is with the flying system. We have control on the kite to steer it, to power and depower it. We have control on the ground station winch connected by this tether. And this is a highly, let's say, dynamic and challenging problem uh, for the control system because wind fluctuates, changes with height. Um, you have wind gusts, and uh, we need to cover all this. 
So control engineers love this subject and they were also the first ones who came up with the idea of airborne wind. We need reliable and robust control, obviously, and the material side of things is also very challenging because this is all plastic in the air, high performance plastic material that degrades in UV light. Can you imagine bring that to Mars? It gets even worse. But the weight advantage is of course big because the transportation overhead to bring this to Mars is much lower than wind turbines. What are the challenges of wind energy on Mars? Very thin atmosphere. Um, uh, we need to mention that only 1% of that on Earth. Um, very high wind speeds and sandstorms, strong daily and um, yearly fluctuations. We will see this a lot later. Very strong radiation, high degree of automation required. Obviously, um, let's say, we want to have launching, landing, and operation covered by, by automated processes. So high degree of reliability, obviously, and the mass budget, of course. These are the recent studies on wind energy on Mars. So not airborne, but just wind. Um, so there were a few. So the topic is getting interesting um, because wind is a renewable resource. Uh, you bring the system there once and you can harvest the energy on location. You don't need to bring your fuel there. So for example, here, this uh, they investigated the, res the wind resource. Uh, also here, this NASA study on the wind resource and uh, then the transportation advantages. So we want to go to with the habitat and the energy system to a lava cave. Think that was also mentioned before. And um, this is the map where we scouted for the right location. I, I have to tell you, before I ventured with the students into this project, I didn't have a good idea what Mars actually means. But a large part of the study was scouting, looking at um, and finding maps and the environmental conditions for all these things, and then identifying the right location and some were midway in the project we decided to go underground in a lava cave um, and we will go to Arzian North that works Arzian North that's this location here it's on the Tharsis bulge it's at 4.6 kilometer altitude that's the Mola um, <clears throat> altitude and it has an average wind speed of 20 meter per second which is quite high. I mean, here on Earth, if you have 10 meter per second, this is already strong, but 20 meter per second with 0 0.01 kilogram per meter cube, the aerodynamic force is a lot lower. That means we need large kites, but that's the big advantage of kites. You can make them large with thin membrane um, without too much weight um, penalty. Uh, we needed to analyze the wind resource. Uh, and here you see at different days of the year, uh, this is the, um, the solar longitude. Uh, you see the wind profile over height and over the daytime. And you clearly see that here's the legend that there are very characteristic dips here in the wind speeds during the day, um, two times. You see also variation in altitude here. So for example, here is a very uh, characteristic wind profile that we need to cover in our analysis. The next step are the probability density functions. Also again, over the year, at different seasons yeah, and at different altitudes. That here. And what's clear is at low altitude, five meter per second, basically have lower wind speeds. And if you go higher, the um, wind speed probability shifts to the right into higher wind speeds. So resource uh, and the the resource analysis was one part of of the whole project. The next part then, okay, this is still resource. Uh, I mentioned this uh, daily and diurnal and annual density variations to see that 
along the year, which is here, the days of the year on Mars, you have quite significant uh, density fluctuations plus over the day here. Yeah? So this is min and max per day, which also influences how much energy you can get out of the wind because the wind energy is uh, density and then multiply it by the wind speed cubed. That's the basic formula. So wind speed is important, but density also. Um, so resource assessment, we go over to the modeling. And in the book chapter that's connected to this, you will find a lot of formulas how we get from our, let's say, kite model um, that flies. It's quite complex. The kinematics is, is very involved. Um, to, um, a, uh, let's say, a harvesting cycle and here you see this um, crosswind patterns and then the return phase. And again, this pumping cycle, pulling and re uh, retracting, pulling again. Need, the cycle needs to be chopped in different phases. And then for each phase, we need a, a specific kinematic model with force analysis. And then we optimize everything. And before the optimization, we have some input, so this is the constant input for this uh, simulation. Too much to go into detail, but just that you know. And then we optimize the operational parameters, the real out and the in speeds of the kite, because they are variables we can play with to determine a power curve. These are the wind speeds, and this is the mechanical power that the kite can harvest see that it rises here we are at rated wind speed and then it goes down again a little bit so ideally you operate in this regime here at these wind speeds to get the maximum from your system and you see these wind speeds are quite high if you want to know more details find this in the book chapter so now we have the power curve we know how much the system produces at what wind speed, and we know what wind speed uh, availability we have, the probability uh, distribution. And the next step, so we know what we can produce, that gives us an annual energy production. And the next step then is to match the demand and the supply of the habitat for this. Uh, our students build um, an energy uh, model for the habitat where on the supply side of things, that's what we have on input, we needed to then compute what the kite can produce. So that's this plot here over the Martian day, uh, where we take into account the wind resource from the previous slides for different kite sizes and what we can get out. So this is really the wind energy we can produce, the wind power in this sense. And here we have the solar, um, uh, irradiation from the Mars Climate Database, because I forgot to mention, um, it's not only airborne wind that we will use, but airborne wind combined with solar PV. As on Earth, also on Mars, it's very important to combine these two energy sources because they are complementary. There, there's often no wind, but you have sun, while when you have no sun, then you have wind. And uh, that's, let's say, that's what a renewable energy system also on work tries to, to, um, to basically complement these sources. So we need solar and wind. And here is over the day, the, 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 sorry, the demand side here in red. So we have resting time and work time over the, the day. And we have here solar power that is provided and wind power from the kind. And this needs to be matched now for every day of the year. And then we get to something like this. You see here the, the energy supply, sorry, the, <clears throat> sorry, we see the daily demand that is this line. We have a constant demand. We request 10 kilowatt uh, of power uh, at every time. And that leads here to these 245 uh, kilowatt hours energy. And that we need to match. And we build this up with wind energy. That's this big blue block here. 
uh, with solar energy, that's this block. And then we have these um, wind energy and solar, wind supply and solar supply from battery, because we need to store. So maybe one step back. So we see, recognize here the production, production line from the kite. So this part here above the demand side, this is stored in a seasonal storage system battery, or we also investigated um, air pressurized air. And um, and you need to buffer this to actually feed into the, let's say, dips here of the system when we don't have enough um, resources. So that's why uh, these parts here buffered around the, the red line. And what you see here in red is actually the supply deficit. And here we use one kite of 300 square meter. Um, here we used two kites of 150 square meter surface area each. Uh, so the same surface area, but the difference is two kites can operate in phase shift. So while one is retracted, the other one can produce and that already allows within the cycle, cyclic operation to buffer some of the energy. You see that we get rid of the supply deficit almost 100%. Okay, now to come to an end, we also designed uh, the, end, the, the complete system and you see here the energy flows that is basically produced by the kite, this by the solar PV. And these are all the losses that go into the components. And in the end, this arrives here at the habitat. Um, and also here we have, you have the energy system architecture with the um, energy generation system, the storage system, and all the components. Um, these are the peer reviewed publications that came out of this study. One journal paper here uh, in the school journal, it's a T-Delft open access journal and three book chapters. Um, this is the one with advancing design to robotic production and assembly. This is the one uh, where Henrietta was the lead author. And um, we basically summarized the Rezone project while these two chapters here focus more on the airborne wind side. Uh, McGowna, the lead author of the uh, of, of this chapter, he looked at scaling effects. So what, how, what do we need to look at when bringing the system from the, the kite system from Earth to Mars uh, with the decreasing density? Um, how are all the system components scaling? So the concept there to use is dimensional analysis. And here in this chapter, it's our main analysis Conclusions, airborne winds on Mars is feasible. Um, uh, soft kites are perfect uh, to comply with the limited transportation budget. Um, and airborne wind is complementary to solar PV. The storage is still an issue. How do we store the energy over the seasons? Um, that brings me to the end. The study was actually founded by Isa, I mentioned this, this nice movie here, how this could look like in drone view in the future. Um, it's a video from Aruba, the Caribbean island where we already operate the kind, but uh, in some red coloring to match the surface. <laughs> uh, so it's fake, but it gives a nice impression. Of Thank you. We move over to our next presentation. That's uh, Robert Lindner from the European Space Agency. While you 